thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're really excited. Um, before we start, I want to thank our Plan for Progress committee members and everyone in attendance tonight uh, for your dedication and participation in the future of our district. Um, tonight, we will hear progress updates from each pillar of the plan, which is academic excellence, uh, modern facilities, and efficient operations. Uh, following this meeting, the community will have an opportunity to provide additional feedback on the plan um, and the progress updates on our website. Um, now we're going to kick it off, first of all, with our Academic Excellence Committee. And I believe we have a special guest, one of our students that's going to be presenting this evening. Hi, I'm Grace Lang and I'm a senior at Pickerington High School Central. Um, so for academic excellence, um, Pickerington schools are committed to engaging all of our students in relevant and worthwhile learning experiences that will prepare them for their future and to be contributing members of society. Um, we believe we can do this through focusing on personalized learning, the development of the whole child and relationships, engaging students in authentic experiences, and improving professional learning. Um, so our first um, portion of this is personalized learning. Every student is different and unique. Um, so to um, cater to every student's needs, we want to um, continue to um, focus more on personalized and individualized learning. Um, we hope that this will allow our students to um, be more engaged and enthusiastic about for enthusiastic about learning, which will prepare them to be lifelong learners. Um, our second um, part of academic excellence is the development of the whole child. Um, we have two goals with this. Um, we want to make sure that our students are feel safe. Um, and comfortable in schools. Um, we can do this through um, making sure that our teachers know how to um, help teach and encourage our students. When our teachers, um, when our students feel safe and comfortable in school, um, they're able to learn and be more excited about coming to school. Um, our second part of this is preparing our students to have the social and emotional skills needed to prepare for their future outside of the classroom. Um, we want to make sure that all of our students are equipped with the needed um, skills to prepare to face challenges and to continue to want to learn um, even when um, they're struggling. Um, our third part of our plan um, is improving and expanding authentic experiences. We want our students to be prepared for a world outside of the classroom. Um, and we can do this by exposing students to real world learning. So that transition to college and the real world and the workforce is smoother. Um, our fourth um, part of the plan is professional learning. We want to make sure that our teachers and administration and additional staff are equipped with resources necessary to create and support high level learning for all students. Good students are created by good teachers who are equipped with the necessary um, knowledge and um, skills to help our students grow. Um, all of these we hope will help our students be more excited about coming to school and be more engaged. We also want these students to be able to leave school, leave Pickerington schools, and um, be prepared and be able to be those contributing members of society and um, have the skills needed to take on um, the rest of their life. Thank you.
So good evening, my name is Brian Seymour. I'm the Director of Instructional Technology uh, for the School District, and myself and Sharon Casamelia, who's the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, were the co-chairs uh, for this group. Uh, so first of all, before we get started, I wanna say thank you to Grace. Uh, as a high school senior, I don't think I could have got up here and done this. And I will say, when we're in these meetings, so at some points we had 30, 35 people in these groups, and it was one of those voices that you know, when you, when you hear it, everybody stops, no matter what group they're in, and that was Grace's voice in our group. So it was a phenomenal having a student in there. Sharon and I have learned so much, and because of her great work, we're gonna continue having more and more students a part of these groups as we go forward uh, with helping with academic success. So we wanna say thank you. We also wanna say thank you to all the group members that, that impart in this. So we had everything from teachers to para pros to principals, assistant principals, community members, and so on and so forth. So. We, uh, we want to thank all those for all the great work that, that happened with us. So basically what I'd like to talk about here is you'll see a graphic that will be very consistent throughout the entire presentation of all three of the groups. And we kind of kept that the way so we'd have consistency and, and it would look nice as well too. Um, so basically what we've got here is we've got a graphic that every single one of the graphics is going to be wrapped up in the community because we know that's really what we're trying to get at. We're trying to improve our community as a whole and improve the life of all of our students and the skills that they have. So with this, you can see, uh, these are our strategies that we've created. So with this, the community driver, or the community strategy that we created, you'll see this across the board with all of them, is Pickering, Pickering and Schools will actively seek feedback and input from community members while developing experiences for knowledge creation for students, staff, and community members. So to be able to do that and to really get to the point of where we're improving our community, we really need to have this idea of professional learning. So one of the things that you've heard, if you've been in the school district for long enough, you've heard it called professional development. We're changing that word now to professional learning. Because I don't know about you, but I don't wake up in the morning and say I want to be developed. All right. So I want to learn as we go through this. So our professional learning is going to be Pickering and Schools will engage educators in professional learning that stimulates their thinking and provides best practices to keep teaching methods up to date. So really we're getting down to that idea of we want teachers to know what or learn what they don't already know. We know teachers bring lots and lots of expertise. So if they already know something or they bring that expertise, why do we need them to sit through another training session? Let's use their valuable time to fill maybe some of those gaps or some of those skills that they don't have the expertise in. So in addition to that, those two pieces then help us drive the three that you see in the middle. And those three, as Grace said, were personalized learning, the whole child and relationships, and authentic experiences. So personalized learning, Pickering Schools will utilize best teaching practices, high quality resources, and effective technology to provide personalized learning for each student. And along with that, we have the whole child and relationships. Pickering Schools will incorporate social emotional learning in a safe environment that encourages students to develop the skills and mindsets that are key to the success. One of the things Grace mentioned was we want students to be safe in school. So if we don't have that and we don't have teachers building good relationships with our students, we know that learning is very difficult to accomplish. And then the last of these is authentic experiences. Pickering and Schools will expose students to authentic experiences inside and outside of the classroom in order to prepare students to become productive members of their school, uh, local, and global communities. So with this, I'd like to change it over to Sharon Casamilio to talk about some big ideas. Let's start with the whole child on the inside part. You'll see that the arrows go all the way around. What we really want to do is develop positive, caring uh, students. Uh, when we know when we do this that people become very relationship oriented and we know that when there's good relationships between students and staff, students and students, staff and staff, that a lot more learning can occur. We'll do this through some social emotional learning. Um, most of you know that we have used the panorama, panorama survey to find out how our students feel about being in school what their sense of belonging is, what, what they feel about their relationships, and we'll continue to look at that. We want to make sure that we build culturally responsive classrooms, um, that we understand that we have a diverse population, and we want to respect and embrace that diversity. Also, it's inclusive. We will include, include all students and make sure that they have high levels of instruction. 
Uh, no student should be excluded from high levels of curriculum. And also we want them to become positive digital citizens. We know that technology, social media, is just the way life is. And so we want to make sure that as our students use those things, that they become very good citizens of that. Um, our personalized learning, competency-based curriculum, meaning that we want to know that students have been able to reach those high standards that are set for our kids, that when they go through a course or a grade level, they've managed to learn what they were supposed to learn in that course or at that particular grade level. We want to look at flexible learning options. Some of our teachers have already learned at, have already um, arranged their classrooms where there's some flexible seating. Uh, also, it's not just uh, the physical part of it, but you know, what are we going to do with virtual learning? What are we going to do with digital learning? So this is uh, a different way of looking at learning than we have always had in the past. Um, also, responsive instruction, <coughs> meaning that we need to respond to students' needs. We need to know where kids are at all times in their learning and then meet them at that point and take them <coughs> forward. And we want to make sure that our kids are exposed to what have been called 21st century skills, which are really things that you might hear as soft skills, but it's problem solving, critical thinking, um, those uh, good communication skills, the things that our community and our businesses are telling us that many of our students are missing when they go out into the world of work. Um, the authentic experiences, we want our kids to experience relevant real world things. Some of that can be done in the classroom. It's simply by giving projects and problems to students that reflect what's happening in the world. They're usually those kinds of things are problem based. Uh, we would like our kids to solve problems that they know are problems that they want to solve, their idea not something that we necessarily tell them. We should be community connected. Um, we're seeing some of that being done with our service learning uh, projects that we've been uh, involved with. Um, these experiences should be student directed, meaning that they should tell us what is it that they want to have as an authentic experience to learn. And we also want to make sure we give kids options, especially in high school, to earn credentials and certifications that can help them as they go into the world of work and just life. And again, as Brian said, that's all wrapped around professional, professional learning, wraps that around, in that if you know we have different pathways for graduation, we have different pathways for teachers to have professional learning. Um, this has been well received by our staff. Um, they're making selections about what it is they want to learn about, what it is that would be beneficial for them so that they can become better at their craft and trade. Um, using a lot of blended learning, our professional development, as, as much as we can, is also job embedded. We're very fortunate to have instructional coaches that can go into classrooms and teach side by side with our instructors to help them become better at their craft. It should be personalized, uh, no different for our teachers than it is for our students. They need to learn what they need to learn, just like our kids want to learn what they want to learn. And also, it should be relevant and purposeful. So those are basically the inner makings of each one of those. I'm really excited about the work we're going to plan for progress and Grace, thank you so much. You did that, you said a lot of things. Um, I think one of the most um, eye-opening experiences for us during this process was, I believe Grace was at our very first meeting and as a high school student who's pretty successful, one of her comments was is sometimes students feel invisible in our district. And that's a telling you know, it's, a, it's an eye-opener because as educators, we think we have the answers sometimes and we're doing a good job, but to hear it come from a student 
that just validates the work that we're doing with our plan for progress. And if and what I wanted to say at the beginning too, I love the idea that we're all the same um, with all three committees. And I've said this in opening convocation to our staff members. The three things that we're talking about, academics, <coughs> modern facilities, and basically efficient operations and finances are all important in our school district. And we heard a presentation from our community center and how we have to go to the community for support. The district is no different. We need community support, which if you saw our, our diagram, community is on every single one of our committee diagrams because that's important for us. So with that being said, and thank you for your presentation, thank you to the academic committee uh, members who participated, I'm gonna turn it over to the uh, modern facilities. Hi, my name is Dwayne Baird. I am uh, a Pickerington grad. I'm a parent to current students. I'm a taxpayer and uh, I'm a building industry professional. I worked at SHP, who is district's architect, from 2008 to 2015, including dozens of projects in Pickerington and school districts all over the state. Uh, over the past several months, I have been working on the Modern Facilities Committee because I thought because of all those roles. I would have a unique perspective, and uh, you know my kids are all in elementary school or younger, so we're in for the long haul. <laughs> so we, we explored many aspects of facilities planning. We looked at the age and condition of the facilities, the importance of uh, modern and flexible spaces, how uh, the district is going to deal with the projected increase in student enrollment as the community is growing again, and how to provide adequate extracurricular and athletic spaces for the students. The most important topic that we looked at was the safety and security, uh, and that is processes and uh, facilities, accommodations. Uh, the most important thing I think for all of us, especially for me as a parent, is to know that our kids are uh, safe and secure when they're in school. And uh, it was interesting and informative to me to learn of all the uh, ongoing monitoring that goes into it on an annual basis and then also uh, continuous improvement and looking at new measures to uh, continuously improve. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had a lot of tough conversations, uh, you know, during these meetings looking at all the different measures that can be implemented to deal with the growing enrollment and the shrinking amount of available space in several of the different buildings. <coughs> so, uh, we looked, like I said, we looked at several different solutions, including uh, some of the tougher ones that would be to upgrade, replace, or even build new schools and athletic facilities. So as the plan becomes finalized, I think that we all were uh, pretty committed to making sure that the conversation stays two ways and that all the stakeholders would be able to provide feedback and that uh, all the community members would be able to uh, stay informed. So it was a big honor for me to be a part of this. Uh, you know, school construction is something that I spent a lot of years uh, being involved in and uh, you know, it's been great for me to be able to apply it here at home. All right, my name is Bob Blackbird. I'm the assistant superintendent for the district. Uh, and as Dwayne had mentioned, uh, our, our committee focused uh, three in, in three areas. We, we focused on uh, building and classroom space, on safety and security, and Vincent's going to talk about safety and security, uh, and also extracurricular uh, facilities. Um, I apologize to people in the audience. Uh, I did pass out binders to our, our board members. Uh, the binders uh, reflect the work that we did in our committees. Uh, and I just briefly want to go through what we have in, in the binders there so you, you know what you're looking at. We do have a list of all of our uh, committee members and a special thanks to uh, uh, Mrs. Niekamp and uh, Mr. Kristoff for serving on the committee. Um, but you have the, the list of the committee members there. You also have a, uh, uh, our minutes. Uh, three of the uh, four meetings we do have minutes but the well, the first meeting we did not have minutes. Uh, we do have, though, in the back of the, the binder, a uh, presentation that Vince presented uh, to the committee. So you do have that. Uh, you also have the building and space avail availability report that was completed. Uh, and we'll, we'll briefly talk about that. Uh, and then you have our, our pillars, um, the, the, really the focus of our work. And that's what we're going to spend most of the time tonight talking about. So, um, so we'll go through that as we go through it. Um, <coughs> here. You can see, and, and Dwayne did mention this about uh, the importance of flexibility in our buildings, 
And uh, that was uh, mentioned in the, the survey that was conducted, our, our, our uh, community survey. And if you've had an opportunity to be in our, our K-6 buildings this year, you're going to see that we have a lot of, we're, we're, using, we're utilizing a lot of space throughout that building. You, you see that uh, the hallways and the, uh, the pot areas have really become an extension of the classroom. We have a lot of flexible furniture out there. You'll see, you'll see kids out in the hallways and out in the pot areas working together collaboratively, um, conducting experiments. So we're, we're really trying to utilize a lot of that space. But my, my section here I'm going to talk about is how we're trying to address the, the growing um, population and uh, space, what we're going to do about identifying space for, for our students. And during, I believe it was the second meeting, we, 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 when we were throwing out considerations, as Duane had mentioned, different ways to address that, we did try to prioritize what we felt was important. So I'm going to just briefly go over those with you. Number one was the enrollment study. And obviously a couple weeks ago you did have um, cooperative strategies come in and, and do that presentation on the enrollment study. But that was driving a lot of our work uh, and also validating any of the considerations that we felt were we needed to be utilizing. Number two was to develop vacant property for future use. Obviously that's the, we're talking about the McGill property there and Vince is going to talk about that here in a little bit. Um, reallocating existing classroom space. You have that report and we'll go over that. Uh, that talks about the, how much space we do have left, some flexibility we have in, in each one of our buildings. Moving programs, um, we've, we've actually started doing that work already this year. We did move a couple of our preschool classrooms from uh, two of our elementary buildings over to Sycamore to create more space there. But we can, we, we've got other programs that we, uh, we, we've talked about that we have the flexibility of moving if we needed to. Uh, renovations, again Vince is going to talk about some of the renovation uh, that we have going on right now in the district to try to create additional space at, at a couple of our buildings. Uh, additions to existing buildings and, and new buildings and facilities we, we, that was thrown out as possibilities and that's going to be part of a, uh, a long-range uh, building plan. Uh, renting facilities if, if needed, uh, redistricting and uh, module bringing in module classrooms and then the last one was uh, creative scheduling, uh, split schedule uh, was, uh, was a, uh, an option that was thrown out as well. So. So if you look at your, this one here, the, the, the modern facilities pillars, and I'm, that document there, that uh, does document the work that we, that we did. And our goal there in, in that area was the district will utilize its current building space to its fullest capacity and effectiveness while creating a long-term plan to address the needs of a growing district. And you see the tactics is, is where we started our work. Uh, the first one there being that we're going to identify available classroom space in each of the buildings. And again, if you go back to that report that we had created, the, the building space availability report, um, it, it lists how much the potential classroom space that we have for each one of the buildings and what we would have to do in those buildings in order to, to make that happen. Um, and examples was, was combining teachers, uh, you know, special needs teachers who might have been utilizing uh, full-size classrooms when they did pull out could be combined into a cl one classroom to, to open up a, an additional classroom space. So, but we did that. Vince and I had a, a meeting with each one of our building principals. Uh, we, we toured the building. We discussed, uh, you know, what were some of the options we could do to create additional classroom space in each one of those buildings. So, so you do have that report that does list uh, how much space is still left in each one of our buildings. The second thing we discussed was to uh, complete the enrollment study. Again, that, like I said, that was going to drive our work uh, and, and any of the considerations that, uh, uh, that we would be making, uh, that, that enrollment study needed to validate that, that work. So uh, that was completed and we'll continue to monitor those numbers uh, as we do our, uh, our roll up uh, to, uh, to address uh, uh, staffing for next year. You know, we'll, we'll all obviously compare those numbers to make sure we're all on on, on, the, on the same page there with the, with the enrollment study. The next one was that we will make program placement adjustments to maintain adequate space for all the buildings. Like I said, we did move our, our preschool this year, two of our preschool classes. Uh, and actually we have now a third preschool class that we opened up at Sycamore. Sycamore had, a, had, a little, had some extra space there in their building, so we moved a, a preschool classroom. Maybe it's two preschool classrooms out of two things, and then one from Violet. 
So we now have four preschool classrooms <laughs> out over at Sycamore. Okay, but by, by moving those, it did create some additional space in, in, uh, at Tusing and at Violet. But we also have that, we have a lot of shared programs uh, in, in the other buildings as well if we needed to do that. So a lot of our special ed programs are shared programs. So if we need to move those classrooms or to uh, another building to create space in that particular building, we do have that flexibility that we could do that. So as well as gifted, we have some, you know, we have the gateway program that uh, currently occupies, I believe, eight classrooms out at, uh, out at Tollgate. So that's always a possibility too if we needed to, to open up space there. So. Okay, and then also PLSD will make necessary renovations to add additional classroom space. And right now we're doing a lot of renovations uh, in two of our buildings, and, and Vince is going to talk about that right now. So, um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the renovations, but I'm also going to talk kind of about the planning strategies and stuff that go into this. Um, every year we roll up the kids to find out how many kids are going to the next classroom, and that's and then we have to look at growth within this. So there's a lot of dynamic moves within this. So every year people will say, you know, why didn't you know that? Or how didn't you know that? It's a very dynamic thing. You've got kids coming in at all different grade levels. And then you're rolling up the current kids to see what you have as your baseline. And then you're going from there. So a lot of this is pre-planning, kind of projections, looking out. And that's why the enrollment study was so important when we did that. So that was our number one priority on that list. If you remember going back to that list, that was the number one priority. And that is what we'll continue to look at as we go forward. So to talk a little bit about some of the renovations, we, at Central High, High School, we created four additional instructional spaces, created a classroom within the media center, created additional space above the commons area, creating an additional conference area to allow conference room to be converted into a classroom, planning to add three additional instruction sp instructional spaces as we go forward. So we're continually looking at our buildings to try to add space where we can, because ultimately, once you run out of space, the next eventuality is a building itself. So we're doing all the stuff that we can right now to make sure that eventuality, we push that out as far as we can. Because we are trying to be you know, economic to our taxpayers, we're trying to do all these true planning moves. So when we talk about this, it's important to know that we're doing all those things ahead of time. You may not see it. You may see a preschool classroom all of a sudden over here. But all those things are being thought about in the back room, background as we go forward. Um, Ridgeview Junior High is a perfect example. We're converting a multi-purpose room into a band room with small instructional spaces. Moving the band allows for two additional classroom spaces in that building. We're, we're looking at Lakeview for programming space right now. We're adding additional space to increase programming. Um, all buildings identified available space in each building for, um, for potential growth, and we moved preschool units as we felt the need to. So as, as we go forward, you'll see moves around the district as we move things around to make space. So it's important to know that even though we're capping space in a building, um, those things are happening all the time. I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. Well, actually, you're, you've got okay. the next one, too, next, so okay. yeah, the McGill property. Um, so. <laughs> okay. The next thing we're going to talk a little bit about the McGill property. That was a property we purchased off of the Lockville and Opportunity Way right next to Central. It's been approximately, I think, 10 years ago or so. Um, or it was 2010, I think, is when we actually purchased the property. Um, that property is now going to be looked at and being developed, and that was our number two priority. If you look at that list, it went from enrollment study to taking our space on the property and saying we're going to develop vacant property as we see, see needed. At this time, we're starting to see that need. Um, to plan for the future, and what I, what I always talk about is being shovel ready for that eventuality out there. And shovel ready means we're going to be ready for that land. That means bringing utilities to the site. <coughs> that means grading the site, planning for the future on that site long enough. Construction time, time frames, and as Dwayne knows, construction time frames can range anywhere two to three years, especially with this um, tight labor market that we're in right now. So it's important that we do all the pre-planning steps forward, design phases, and as we talk about long-term planning, we'll get into the, the, the idea of long-term planning and sitting down in work sessions and going through what are some of the things we can do as far as long-term planning. But the idea of that long-term planning is to make sure you know, we do all the pre-planning to make sure we hit that design phase and we hit those marks running so that we can cut the time frame of building a building to two years. Because, you know, I've been here long enough to know this kind of sneaks up on you, this growth in the district. 
So we want to make sure we're ready for, for that. And then the final tactic that we had on, on our list there to address facilities and, and building space was the creation of a long-term building plan. And, and what that would incorporate would be in any of your um, additions to existing buildings, any new facilities that you would be building, uh, or any new buildings, any new facilities around those buildings that would need to be constructed. Okay, all that would become part of this long-term plan that we would design. And, and, and one of the things that we talked about is, is possibly doing a, uh, the board doing a work session to discuss you know, what are some of the options. When would we, when would we need to have uh, these, these, you know, the, the building ready to go, that, that type of thing as we look at our enrollment studies. So, okay. All right, so Vince is going to talk about the, uh, the safety and security section of our, our works. So. Um, one of the things in the, the last few years, and unfortunately, Sorry. I want to bring that up, unfortunately, we, we have to be very concerned about the safety and security of our, our buildings with some of the violent, tragic things that have happened um, in the recent past. Um, one of the things we want to make sure that we talk about is some of the things and tactics and strategies we're moving forward. Um, it, one of our tactics was we'll, we'll create processes to ensure building security throughout the day. And one of the things we do in, dis in, in our district is make sure there's door checks every day. So the important thing to remember about that is our custodians go around, they slide their card to ensure that we know they logged a door and that way we know that a door was logged and it was actually checked. And the importance of that is um, that we're checking one, the door, the mechanism actually works, the, the mechanism actually works, and that we're looking um, at that as we go along. So one of the most important things is, so this, these custodians go around the buildings, check the doors, they're checking for really two things. The mechanism's on the door, and the second thing is to make sure that the door has not been propped. Um, like, like most things, you know, kid comes in, they're waiting for another kid, sometimes things happen. So the, our, one of our biggest things is our education, both with our staff and our students, to making sure doors aren't propped in the district. It's one of the most important things we emphasize. Um, so we have a door log, you know, the, when they actually log the door, check the door to make sure it's been closed. If anything is wrong with that door, so the district office knows that door needs fixed appropriately and as soon as possible. The next thing is um, incorporate a security tracking system for required emergency drills. Right now we use Navigate software and most of the principals have to log all their drills. We're required by law to do so many drills, fire drills, security drills, lockdown drills um, throughout the year. So we have to log those and make sure they're in the program and it's just an electronic tracking mechanism that we look at every year. We have to take these and give them the state to make sure that they know we're actually doing our drills. Pickering's local school district will create a common visitor sign-in procedure and we've worked on this across the district. And that's just how we sign in people. When they come in the door, what's the greeting gonna be? How are they greeted? Are we doing our greeting? So that's been checked and, and, and kind of secured throughout our district. will identify and install security cameras. In the last couple of years, security cameras have been, become the, the, the biggest wave in, in technology in our district as far as on buses and, and inside the buildings because we can identify kids. As you can well imagine, it's much easier to see a film and, and straighten out the situation because um, you'll get many, many stories from both students or staff of what happened in an incident. The cameras help to clarify those situations as to what really went on. Um, the next is a substitute um, kind of sign-in pr procedure, and that's checking in to make sure the substitute is who they are, logging their ID, making sure we know who they are, and that they're in the building appropriately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing that are kind of, you know, innovative things, kind of stuff we'd like to do. One of the things is LED lights, even though, you know, you, how, do, how do you link that to security? Well, we're doing them on the outside of the perimeter of the building which helps light up the building and we can actually see better coming in and the cameras actually have a better visual on the things as, w as well as inside the building but mostly on the outside when we talk about security. Um, add additional cameras every year. We identify with our principals that you know, everybody seems to find a vacant area where the camera does not exist. So we continually add more and more cameras to the buildings and um, that is an ongoing process throughout the year. Um, right now, we just 
put in silent alarms in our building. So there's, there's, there's like three different safety features right now going on. There's the Navigate program, which is on our phone. So people have a chance, uh, staff teachers who, who um, put these down on their phone have a chance to log this very quickly in an emergency situation inside the building. Any place in the building, any place outside the building um, can put our building on immediate lockdown if a threat exists. The other way, um, we're, we're, we have an actual silent alarm in the building. Um, that silent alarm is pressed, it sends out a text to all of our staff at the central office, but more important, sends it out to our safety services and they're notified immediately on what's going on. That's a silent alarm to make sure. So that's the second. Three, right now we're working on um, the walkie talkies in our building to actually have a third process that hasn't been linked up. We've been working with the, the city on this and it's been a great thing. I wanna congratulate the city for helping us, one, get on our tower their tower out there so we can um, have better communications with our buses but this is also going to allow us to have better communications inside our buildings and send out an immediate alarm and assistance to them so that that's an important part um, so as we go through um, these communications um, we introduced like I said a communication um, trained staff and security app um, and updated our radio communications throughout the building um, the next thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is the extracurricular facilities. Um, as we go through, um, we're, we're developing our, one of the goals we have is our tactics. Pickering Local School District will develop extracurricular facilities for game competition and performance. So, you know, one of that, how do, how do we measure that? One of the desired outcomes is we'll provide high quality facilities that are comparable to surrounding and, and in competing districts. Um, continual review and evaluation for inclusion and future capital improvement plans. Um, we'll identify areas that need upgraded, um, and then we're gonna talk about some of the things. Pickering Local School District will improve the green space that is available for use uh, for extracurricular facilities. We'll continue to improve ac accessibility to our facilities. Let's talk just one improving playing surfaces um, at, at our fields. Right now we're going an extensive kind of overview to, to look at what fields need, need upgrading, which ones need better drainage, which ones better surfaces. So we increase our playing surfaces and incre increase our, um, our practice facilities as well to take off the pressure off those main playing fields. And I think that was a, a major thing that we talked about. Um, add water um, bleachers to our pre-existing fields, and then a little bit about the McGill property as well. Again, this comes up in our um, extracurricular portion as well, is to talk about what we're talking about phase two and adding additional fields at some point and, and doing additional work on that. And that's, that's a, as we get in the future and as we upgrade this site and we do the, those will be things we'll be thinking about and probably putting planning sessions together as far as that goes as well. And that we consider that a phase two of that project. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the fiscal operations and efficient operations pillar uh, is going to present now. I'd like to first of all thank John Mallory, um, who dressed up in a suit like Just me. For you. Looks Just awesome. For you. <laughs> he's, a, he's a banker it's like me, banker. and he has to go yeah. every day. Uh, Jennifer Sharkey, uh, who is a, um, a senior internal auditor, uh, is also on the committee. I thank her for her work. Um, Clay Lopez, Keith Kristoff, uh, the board members that served, and of course Dr. Briggs. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John, and then after he's done, I'll come back and say a few words. Thank you, John. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Um, just want to highlight tonight uh, four pillars from what our group talked about. The first pillar that we talked about related to efficient operations is really how to be effective. And by effective, what we mean is by the schools regularly monitoring and, ass and assessing the use of resources. Um, this ensures that the resources are being expended for purposes that have the most impact on student achievement and to make a point to evaluate our process compared to trends. We also think that what it does is it keeps to a schedule to remain timely in assessments of our operations. Being prepared. Being prepared means remaining equipped to positively impact student performance by using a wide variety of relevant financial data and information to plan for the future and hone and develop sound fiscal policies 
procedures, processes. Being prepared also means forward thinking, being engaged, um, anticipating change. We think it's important to be transparent. So what is that? Looking at Pickerington widely dis disseminating and making financial information available to all stakeholders. Decision makers will be provided with relevant data that will impact student performance. We think being transparent will also enhance the trust and the confidence in the district's efforts. Lastly is resource stewardship. We think if Pickerington School successfully incorporates responsible planning while maximizing the care and management of its resources, we can provide our stakeholders a value proposition that impacts student achievement and we can maintain a solid relationship with the community. Thank you, John. And again, I appreciate the work uh, that all of the committee did in the efficient operations. Um, the green circle really, I hope, um, you know, encompasses what we're trying to be about, and that is resource stewardship, to pull out a, an old English word. Um, I asked my sons the other day if they knew what a steward was, and they just kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about, Dad? And and they started quoting when, was, when they were kids we watched Lord of the Rings and there's a, a steward in there of, of the kingdom of Gondor I'm, I'm going geeky on you here tonight <laughs> so they said is that what that means and I said no well sort of um, but as John was uh, very eloquent in saying it really boils down to being prepared being effective and being transparent uh, I, I believe that that is the core of solid uh, financial uh, and efficient operations, uh, making sure that all stakeholders, uh, internal and external, have what they need to make the decisions uh, that they need to make. Uh, and so John covered quite a bit of, of what's uh, in this particular slide, uh, but then we spent time uh, trying to, uh, again, create a vision of well, what does it mean to be prepared and we thought of forward thinking, engaged, anticipating change. Uh, what does it mean to be transparent? And clearly that's being accessible, open, and relevant disclosure of data. Uh, what does it mean to be effective? We think that's wise resource management. Uh, we think that's relevant decision making, being evaluative, um, you know, reflecting on, on the decisions you've made, seeing where they've been successful and where they haven't been. And finally, uh, all of that gets thrown out the window if you don't do it in a timely fashion. And so uh, the green circle encompasses uh, all of those with adjectives like responsible, prudent use of resources, and then our ultimate goal, uh, the value proposition that we make to our community and all of our stakeholders. Um, so really, that captures a lot of, of what efficient operations were about. And then this final uh, graphic uh, shows each of the pillars, again, that common uh, ideology uh, and representation that you can see there uh, of academic excellence, modern facilities, and efficient operations. Um, I just uh, want to thank the board members again. Um, all of our board served on at least one committee, and that was very intentional, obviously, because the work we're doing is pretty important. Um, so, and again, Lori Sanders and Michelle um, served on the academic committee. Uh, Vanessa was on the facility committee, Clay was on the finance committee and the operations, and Keith was lucky enough to serve on two committees, the facilities and the finance. So I want to thank our board members for being part of the process. Um, again, thank you to all the presenters tonight. Um, as we embark on the finalizing the plan, um, I encourage the entire community to visit our website, uh, watch the video of tonight's presentations, and provide additional feedback of the plan. There's a lot of information shared tonight. Um, so please take the time, um, if you're a community member, to watch it.